Shabbat Shalom. There are some people who walk out into the woods and who see the dirt and the bugs and the allergy-causing trees and say, yuck. I know some of these people. I might be one of them. Apparently, I hear there are other people who walk out into the woods and see God's creation. They see beauty. They see and feel fresh air. They feel the breeze on their arms. And they look at the woods and they say, how beautiful is God's creation. I've met people like that too. There are people who walk into a synagogue, who hear the Hebrew, see all the ritual, and feel overwhelmed and intimidated by all of that. There are other people who walk into a synagogue and what they feel, what we feel, is sanctuary. It's all a matter of perspective on the very same thing. This past week we know that the P5 plus Germany marked a deal with Iran, which ultimately would allow a variety of things, including arms control on Iran and some of their nuclear facilities, but also an end, by and large, to many of the sanctions that have been posed on Iran over the last two years. Whether it's a good deal or a bad deal depends very much on your perspective, where you're coming from, how you grew up, what your priorities are. And of course, if you look at President Obama and you look at Prime Minister Netanyahu, you have two men from very different perspectives. And of course, I don't really have enough hands to say on the one hand and on the other hand for all the different issues that are involved in whether this deal with Iran is a good deal or a bad deal. So I did try to look at it from the perspective of Jewish law. And what does Jewish law come to inform us about how we should feel about this deal with Iran? First and foremost, what I really sought to understand the whole complexities of this issue, I looked first at the goals of the two men who seemed to be the biggest proponent and the biggest opponent. So I went first to President Obama. And in an interview with Thomas Friedman in the New York Times, this is what the President said, and I quote, We are not measuring this deal by whether it is changing the regime inside of Iran, said the President. We're not measuring this deal by whether we're solving every problem that can be traced back to Iran, whether we are eliminating all their nefarious activities around the globe. We are measuring this deal, and the President says, and that was the original premise of this conversation, including by Prime Minister Netanyahu, Iran could not get a nuclear weapon. That was always the discussion. And what I'm going to be able to say, the President says, and I think we will be able to prove, is that this, by a wide margin, is the most definitive path by which Iran will not get a nuclear weapon. And we will be able to achieve that with the full cooperation of the world community and without having to engage in another war in the Middle East. Those were the President's goals. To avoid a nuclear Iran, and by all account, even after two years' worth of sanctions, And again, depending on where you are, you believe that those sanctions are working or you think those sanctions are not working. But after two years of sanctions, Iran, an avowed enemy of Israel, a country that has said that if they have the capabilities, they would push Israel into the sea, a true and lasting existential threat to the state of Israel, are without any change two to three months away from acquiring a nuclear weapon two to three months away from acquiring a nuclear weapon. This is why the Prime Minister of Israel is so adamant about our engagement with Iran, or disengagement, depending on how you perceive it. And this is why the President and the other countries of the world are so adamant that we continue to do something vis-a-vis Iran. Because left unchecked, they're two to three months away from a nuclear bomb. So here we have the President of the United States. And what are the President's priorities? And he says them to us. To avoid a nuclear Iran to unite a world community, 
and to avoid another war in the Middle East. The code that I think he is referring to but not mentioning specifically is the threat of ISIS. Among the president's biggest fears is a nuclear Iran ballistic missiles to the United States, a nuclear Iran that could smuggle a small nuclear weapon into our country. And of course, his other big fear is the spread of ISIS throughout the Middle East. Those, I think, are the big priorities for President Obama. And in striking this deal with Iran, the P5 plus Germany, he believes, will come to avoid a nuclear Iran and will come to be able to partner with countries throughout the world, but especially Iran, against ISIS. You'll pardon me, in addition to all the mosquito bites I brought back from Camp Ramah last week, I came back with a wonderful cold as well. Prime Minister Netanyahu sees the world differently. The Prime Minister announced on July 14th two major concerns regarding the agreement the P5 plus Germany struck with Iran. These are his two concerns, and I quote, one, the agreement allows Iran to develop extensive capabilities that will serve it in arming itself with nuclear weapons, whether at the end of the period of the agreement in another 10 to 15 years or earlier, if it violates the agreement." End quote. What are Prime Minister Netanyahu's concerns? One is that the agreement does not do enough to limit Iran's ability to gain and develop nuclear weapons whether that's after the period of the agreement ends in 10 to 15 years, or even during the period, should they decide to thwart the efforts of the deal. And second, his second concern, and I quote, the agreement channels hundreds of billions of dollars to Iran's terrorism and war machine, a war that is directed against us and against others in the region. Prime Minister Netanyahu's second big concern is that Iran is already spreading what little money it has throughout the Middle East to support terror, to support Hezbollah, to support acts of war against the state of Israel. Iran is a supporter of terrorism wherever it can get its hands. And so Prime Minister Netanyahu is concerned that with these hundreds of millions of dollars that are now allowed to go into Iran, because of the end of the sanctions, that they will continue to spread terror and threaten Israel throughout the Middle East. The President, however, of the United States has already stated that that is not a direct goal of his to counter. He wants to counter it in other ways. Uh, look, he's already in conversations, I hear, with Israel to figure out other ways that they can thwart that issue. But he sees a nuclear Iran as a bigger threat even than the hundreds of millions of dollars might spend in, in terrorism throughout the Middle East. We're talking about two men, both who want peace in this world, who want securities for their country and the other countries, but who are coming at it from two very different ways. And so I'll be honest with you, I, I wrestled. I spent a lot of hours reading and researching and studying as to what exactly I think is the right path. And if you go to whitehouse.gov, you'll find a number of resources and information about this deal and the president's perceived strengths of this deal. And if you go to APAC.org, or you go to AJC.org, or you go to ZOA.org, or you go to any of the other major pro-Israel organizations, you'll find all the reasons why this deal is bad. I encourage you to do the research. And on your way out this morning at the end of services, I actually have some charts and graphs from the White House as well as some charts from APAC that I provided that you're welcome to take on your way out the door. So I thought long and hard about what we as Jews, as a Jewish community, do with this deal with Iran. And of course, as we do on all issues, foreign and domestic, we consult our tradition, we consult our laws to say where do we stand on this issue. The mitzvot are clear with regard to the right of the Jewish people to engage in self-defense. And I quote now from the Talmud, if someone comes to kill you, get up early in the morning to kill him first. 
Even though the Ten Commandments state very clearly, Lo tzach, you shall not murder. When it comes to self-defense, our tradition is very clear that self-defense is not an act of murder and that we are justified to protect ourselves. Furthermore, the Talmud goes on to say, Rav Judah said in the name of Rav, if foreigners besieged Israelite towns, it is not permitted to go forth against them with weapons or to desecrate the Sabbath in any other way on their account. In what case was this rule said where they came over a matter of money? That is to say, the threat was only to property. The Talmud goes on. But if they came over a matter of lives, that is to say, Jewish lives are at risk. Jews may go out against these foreigners with their weapons and may even violate Shabbat because of them. And with regard to a city close to the border of the Jewish area, the loss of which would constitute a strategic danger to the other parts of the country, even if the foreigners did not come over a matter of lives, but merely over a matter of straw and stubble, Jews may go out against them with their weapons and even violate Shabbat because of them. It is not only permissible to engage in an act of self-defense, but when it comes to the safety of the state of Israel, Jews throughout the world, and especially those charged with defense of the state of Israel, have a divine obligation. It is a mitzvah. It is a commandment to do whatever is necessary to protect the state of Israel. Now again, we come back to on this hand and on that hand. So on this hand, we know that it is a mitzvah. It is a divine obligation to do whatever we can to protect the state of Israel. At the same time, we also know that we're supposed to be ohev shalom v'rodef shalom. We're supposed to love peace. We're supposed to pursue peace. So it is we turn back to our tradition. And here we turn to the book of Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy tells us when you come near a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace to it. Before engaging in an act of war, before engaging in an act of self-defense, our first obligation is to proclaim peace, to offer a peace agreement. Maimonides comments, if the enemy accepts the offer of peace and commits itself to the fulfillment of the seven meets vote that were commanded to Noah's descendants, none of them should be killed. If they offer peace, if, they accept, if we offer peace and they accept peace, we have to abide by that peace deal. And it shall be, the Torah goes on to say, it shall be if it gives you an answer of peace and opens to you, then it shall be that all the people that are found in it shall be tributaries to you and they shall serve you. But if it will make no peace with you and will make war against you, then you shall besiege it. If you offer peace and they don't accept peace, you can go to war against it. Now Rashi comes to say, Scripture tells you that if it does not make peace with you, it will in the end make war against you if you leave it alone and go away. If you try to make peace and it does not make peace with you, it will in the end make war against you if you leave it alone and go away. I've studied this deal and I've looked at it and I've tried to look at every side and I have to tell you at the end, while two years of sanctions have been held against Iran and by and large we, we see for the most part those sanctions have been successful. And in those two years the United States of America has been engaging in peace negotiations with Iran. For the first time in four decades we brought Iran to the table and we've no longer seen it and tried to isolate it as we've done since the Ayatollah came into power, but rather we brought them to the conversation, we have brought them to a civilized discussion with the, the world of nations, and that's a good thing. In fact, I would even argue it's a mitzvah to engage in peace negotiations with anybody who will sit down at the table with us. Nevertheless, in those two years of peace negotiations, we've seen an Iran that has continued to try to develop a nuclear bomb, We've seen in Iran that, is uh, that it continues to contribute money to Hezbollah and those who threaten the state of Israel. 
And despite desiring peace and loving peace and wanting peace, my concern is that this deal does not do enough to protect the state of Israel. And thus, it is a mitzvah on me as a Jew to say that this deal is not a good deal or it's not a good enough deal. And that at minimum, we should go back to the drawing board and say, what more can we do? And at worst, I think the state of Israel needs not necessarily attack, but certainly needs to prepare for an Iran who may be able to attack it either directly or indirectly. It's a scary time in the world right now. Let us pray for a time of peace, a time of understanding. Let us pray for countries who are willing to support each other and pursue peace without risking the state of Israel to do so. O say shalom bim romav, hu ya say shalom. May the one who makes peace in the heavens above grant peace to all of us on earth below. And let us say together, Amen.